Welcome back everybody to Medical Engineering. Today we want to talk a little bit about x-rays and in particular we want to talk about all the features of x-rays, how they have been discovered, then we want to figure out how to actually generate them and in the later two videos we want to see how they interact with the matter and then finally also see how the actual image is formed. In today's video we will start and we will introduce the x-ray radiations and how they have been discovered and how to actually generate them. So looking forward to be exploring a little bit of x-ray physics with you. So medical engineering imaging systems x-rays. Now what we will look at today. So we will start with the history of x-rays and then we want to talk about the generation of x-rays and then continue and look into a couple of more details of x-rays in the following videos. So let's start with the discovery. The x-rays have been discovered actually by Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen and they were discovered already in 1895 actually on the 8th of November. And already on December 28, Röntgen publishes his paper über eine neue Art von Strahlen, on a new kind of X-rays. And you can see that he was very quick. So he discovered the effect in early November and already right after Christmas, he was able to publish the paper. So he got really excited as he discovered the X-rays because they were really different. And you could suddenly see things that you couldn't see before. And as you may know, Röntgen also received the Nobel Prize for this discovery. Röntgen actually donated his discovery to the entire world and he never published a patent or something like this. So you can see then shortly after the discovery of x-rays, there's actually three big companies emerging and they are today still part of the three big medical imaging companies that you may be aware of. So these inventions sparked companies that then fused over the years with other companies, but they are now fundamental parts of General Electric, Siemens Healthineers, as well as Philips. So quite interesting if you're interested of the entire story. I can recommend to have a look into the book and there you will see how the x-rays were discovered. There's also a notion on the image that you see here on the right hand side. There's actually two images that have been created very early and sometimes they get confused. So there is the original image that you see here on the right hand side where Röntgen actually imaged the hand of his wife. And you can see here that you see very well on the image the bones inside the hand and you can also see the ring. There's also a much sharper image that then was created in a live demonstration and this is the hand of Mr. Kölicke. And this image is much sharper and you can see that it is very similar because Kölicke also wears a ring and sometimes the two images get confused. So if you're interested in the whole story about the confusion of these different images, this is also inside the textbook. So I really recommend to have a look at that. So we have a lot of supplementary material here, much more than we can cover here in this short video. Now, what are x-rays being used for? X-rays are being used quite frequently. For example, here on the right hand side, you see a lung image and this is a typical chest x-ray that is taken in order to find problems in the lung tumors or any bleedings or you can also use it to diagnose the breast. On the left hand side you see a breast x-ray image that is being used in order also to spot tumors. So a very common technique to look inside the body. And what's really surprising and magnificent about the technology, it's not just that you can image with light, but you can also see through the body and you can see stuff that's inside of the body. And this was a huge discovery and people got very, very excited about that. Thank you. 
So what's actually the X-ray phenomenon? Well, X-rays are a kind of very hard light. So here you see the electromagnetic spectrum from long radio waves over radio waves to microwaves. So you see in this regime you have the MR imaging taking place. Then there is infrared visible light, the things that we can perceive with our eyes, but as well with endoscopes and you see that we also use them in, in microscopes as well. And then we see that there is ultraviolet light. So this is already a high energetic light. And if we go further down this road, we get more energetic radiation and this is X-rays. And then if you go even beyond that, then there is gamma rays. So you see that the wavelength is actually shortening and therewith the frequency is of course increased. And on the other hand, with the decreasing wavelength, you also have an increase in energy. So X-rays are a kind of electromagnetic radiation, but it has a very short wavelength. So it has very high energy and typical wavelengths for X-rays are 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 11 meters. So of course, the energy is related to the frequency of the light and you can actually convert this if you know Planck's constant. So you see here Planck's constant times the propagation speed C0 and you divide that over the wavelength. With that you can determine the energy. A typical unit to measure X-rays is the electron volt. So this is how you typically describe how strong a specific X-ray is and it describes the energy of that particular X-ray. So one electron volt is the kinetic energy of a particle with the charge of one electron that is achieved when accelerated with a potential difference of one volt. So we'll see that this is very important when we generate actually the X-rays and why we choose that particular unit. For now, just remember this is an energy and it's related to charge and acceleration voltage. Now, X-rays are also being absorbed inside of the body and the actual signal that we observe is that we emit X-rays and they get absorbed somewhere in the body and the difference between the illuminated pixels that did not receive any hard objects that would absorb the X-rays and the actual pixels that have been absorbed is the contrast that we see. So the harder, the denser a material is, the higher the contrast will be in an X-ray image. Also note that you essentially perceive a superposition of all of the objects along the ray. So what you're effectively measuring with an X-ray is accumulation. You could say something similar to a sum of all of the objects along the path. It's slightly more difficult, but we'll see that in a bit. But for the time being, you can imagine that you essentially see a sum of everything that is along the path. And we will be able to describe that also in terms of physics in a couple of slides. So you can see that dense objects are visible very well. And this is also the reason why bones then appear darker than soft tissues, because they simply absorb more photons. And then the amount of attenuation is not just determined by the material, but it also depends on the energy of the X-rays. So the more energy your X-rays have, the more easily they will penetrate different materials. This is also something that we will talk about when we discuss the interaction of photons with matter in the next video, actually. Well, there is a couple of things that are interesting about X-rays. So they generally propagate from the source to the detector and they can be assumed to be more or less moving along straight lines. So in homogeneous materials, you can say an X-ray will just go through the material and then there is a couple of effects that can happen with the X-ray. But generally, if no such effect is happening, the X-ray is just flying through the object and nothing big will happen. There is refraction, which is essentially happening at the boundary of two different kind of media.
And you see refraction has been a huge thing in optics because it allows us to understand lenses. So the light or visible light is then refracted on the surface of lenses and this allows us to work with magnification and so on. In x-rays, the refraction is very small. So our x-rays like to just go through the materials in different media without undergoing through a big refraction. And this is also one of the reasons why it's very challenging to build x-ray lenses. But there's other techniques that you can use to increase the magnification. And this can be done, for example, with geometry. And we will have a couple of examples when we talk about the image formation. Now there's also an effect that's called diffraction and diffraction is happening if your x-ray is being bent when it passes through a slit or an edge. And this is then the so-called diffraction effect and diffraction enables us to perform so-called phase contrast imaging. And we'll have a dedicated video about phase contrast imaging and dark field imaging using x-rays and there we will talk about slits and diffraction patterns and so on. But this is something that we'll talk about towards the very end when we already explored the x-rays and when we explored the different ways of using the x-rays. So something to come later, but I think it's a very important point that you also understand the diffraction of x-rays. Now let's start at the very beginning and the very beginning is the generation. Now what did Röntgen actually discover? So he discovered that when he applies a voltage to a kind of vacuum tube where he has an anode and a cathode, what then happens is that there is some strange radiation that is being emitted. And what he actually found is that this radiation is essentially darkening photoplates. So there's, there's plates that you can also use in photography and they react with light. And what happened is that Röntgen discovered that although he can't see any of the light, there is some effect happening on this photoplate. So this is essentially a kind of chemical compound that then reacts if there is some light coming in and it darkens. So this is a very early technique of photography actually. So what Röntgen did is he had these photoplates and he was trying to generate light with higher energies and then he discovered that although he shielded the light away using cardboard he could still find that his photoplate was darkened. So some kind of radiation arrived there. And then he got really thrilled and found this a very strange effect. And he was using rather high acceleration voltages in order to generate this effect. And this is why in the beginning he called it X-rays, because this kind of X radiation was miraculous to him and he didn't understand it. Then he found that it's associated to high acceleration voltages and this generates some kind of, well, high energetic radiation and the radiation is able to penetrate the cardboard. Then through his studies and his experiments he later figured out that he could also go through denser materials and this is then how this actual image of the hand was generated because he figured out that this kind of radiation is being absorbed in particular objects. Obviously he didn't know about cancer risks and that x-rays are a radiation that has also the risk of breaking down the DNA inside your body and these kind of exposures he didn't know about. So Röntgen found that this is really an exciting technique and it allows to look inside the body. What he did is he used this vacuum kind of tube, applied a high voltage and what happens now is that from the cathode the electrons are being taken out so they get accelerated and then they hit onto the anode. So when the electron that leaves the cathode hits the anode, it's converted. And it's converted into electromagnetic radiation and this electromagnetic radiation is actually the X-rays. And now you see 
why we're measuring the energy in electron volts because we essentially accelerate one electron and this electron then hits the anode and when hitting the anode it gets converted into electromagnetic radiation and this electromagnetic radiation is then sent into the scene and it gets detected hopefully at some detector plate. So this is the schematic and obviously these things look a little different today so typically the cathode is the negative side of the tube and it consists of two principal parts so there's the filament and the filament is essentially the part where the electrons then emerge and then what is also happening typically is that you have these cup housing for the filaments and it has a negative voltage to focus the beam onto a small area. So this is the focusing cap and the filaments and you also find that they have a long axis and a short axis and often you use that in order to reduce the size of the point where actually the electrons can emerge. So this has also something to do later with the size of the projection of the filament onto the anode material. So if you take the structure, then you have some advantages if you want to have only a small spot where they hit. The next thing is the anode. And this is an anode that is very similar to the one that Röntgen has been using. So this is essentially the positive side of the tube, so where the electrons then hit and there are different types of this anode. So what you see here in this image is a stationary anode. So here you essentially have a metal plate and oftentimes this is made of some hard material and you also have to make sure that it doesn't burn down because you have the electrons hitting all the time and the hitting of the electrons actually causes a lot of heat. So you want to have a dense material that is able to take the heat load. Very often this is some material like tungsten. And then this material gets hit with the electrons and from the actual anode dish, then the X-rays are generated. What you also do quite often is that you place it at a certain angle, just that you make sure that you hit on this side, that the X-rays then emerge into a particular direction with a higher likelihood. So this is also done in order to make sure that most of the generated X-rays actually then go into the scene and not too much heat is generated. Well, heat is a problem, which is the reason why there's also the so-called rotating anodes. And these are being used in order to get away with the heat load. So you have a rotating anode and it essentially also has a certain shape, a circular shape. And then the electrons always hit onto a different position. And by the rotation, you allow the anode actually to cool down. And when you receive again after 360 degree on the other side, then the anode has already cooled down a little bit. And this way you can just generate more photons at a time and it allows us to build much stronger X-ray tubes. So what is typically a trade-off is that if you have high power, you have short exposure times. Yeah? So high power means many photons are generated. And this means that you can have also a high frame rate. So you can also make many images per second. But on the other hand, you also want to have a small focus. So you want the location on the anode dish to be very, very small because only this way we are able to have a small so-called focal spot and this is the optical center. And the small optical spot is really important because otherwise we get blurring and we'll show that's in fact actually on the next slide. Then there is also a variable photon energy and the photon energy determines the contrast. And we see that if they have lower energy, they are more likely to be absorbed 
but then they can also get much better soft tissue contrasts. If they have high energies, they're not as likely to be absorbed, and then you only get contrasts in very dense tissues such as bones. So there's a trade-off with that as well. And then of course you want to have a cost-efficient production for the source, and you want them to be long in service and have a long durability. So this is also why there's many different layouts of these X-ray sources that have been explored. So let's look at the focal spot size. So the focal spot size is important because it inherently introduces a kind of blur. And I can show you this here on this slide. So let's say this is our focal spot. So you see here the green side is the left side that passes left of the subject and right of the subject here. And then in red, we also have to connect the right side of the focal spot with the subject and the right side of the focal spot with the subject. And you see that they hit this actually object under investigation at a different point, And this causes this penumbra effect. And this penumbra effect causes blurring, so a loss in spatial resolution. We will see that we can also use this then to derive a formula that allows us to determine the resolution of the system. But this is something that we will introduce when we talk about actually computed tomography and how to get 3D volumes from that. Now, if we do that, then we can understand that a small focal spot is really important. And this is one of the main reasons why people have been introducing these kind of X-ray sources. And you see here, this also has a vacuum, but then you have this rotating anode. So you see this guy here, this is the anode dish, this is the cathode, and then you can use bearings here in order to rotate this guy. And when we then return to the original position, we already had some time to cool down the anode and we can inflict much more electrons without melting the material. And obviously we need this glass envelope because everything is in vacuum. Now let's have a look at the schematic here. And this is now flipped, but you still have the rotor here. Then you have the rotating anode here. And here you then have the X-rays. They are generated here and they are generated because we have some electrons hitting the anode dish from the cathode and this generates our X-rays. So all of this is of course in vacuum. You may think that there is a hole here in the schematic, but this is just for showing that there is a window. Obviously the X-rays have enough energy to penetrate the glass. So that's not a huge issue. But what typically is happening is that this entire tube is in a big housing and this housing then has a window here because you want to emit only into one direction and you want to filter out all of the x-rays that would potentially leave the source scattered into these directions. So this is also a very important point here. Then typically we use voltages from 20 to 150 kilovolts and then we can generate a different number of photons and this is determined essentially by the current. And for continuous operation and continuous movement, then typically the current is in the range between one to five milliamperes. And if you have a pulsed X-ray source that is generating image by image, like you would do with a flash of light in a camera, then you have currents from 0.1 to up to one ampere. So this is really short exposure and this allows us for example, to take really quick shots. And this is also relevant if you have, for example, motion in the scene. So there you want to have very fast shots because otherwise you introduce additional blurring because the patient is breathing, for example. So let's go ahead and talk a bit about the different types of X-rays. And this is 
essentially governed by three regimes that people talk about. So there's soft X-rays. So there the acceleration voltage UA is up to one kilovolt and they have 10 to one nanometer in wavelength. Then there's the average X-rays. They are up to 10 kilovolts and the hard X-rays, they range from 10 to 120 kilovolts. And the hard X-rays are the ones that we typically use in medical diagnosis and they have wavelengths from 0.1 to 0.01 nanometers. So this is very short wavelengths and high energy and we need the high energy in order to penetrate the body. You know there's a couple of centimeters of water and bones in the way and you have to be able to transmit the rays through the entire body in order to get an image on the other side. So this is why you need rather high acceleration voltages. Speaking of that, we can now have a look into the X-ray spectrum. So when you generate X-rays, you don't just get X-rays of a single energy, but they're essentially distributed over a whole range of energies. So what happens if you accelerate with a certain voltage is that the electrons then hit the anode dish and by hitting the anode they get converted into x-rays. But it's not like that one electron is typically completely converted into one x-ray. It happens and this is why you can see here on this plot that it has a highest energy. So this is the energy. Yeah, On this scale you see the energy and here you see a relative intensity or you could also think of um, a photon count or a kind of histogram. So this is the probability for this X-ray energy to emerge and here we see the X-ray energy. And here you see in red that there is no energy higher than 120 kilo electron volts actually appearing and this is of course the energy that is used for acceleration. So if I accelerate with 120 kilovolts and I have one electron, the entire energy can be converted into a single X-ray and that would be an X-ray with 120 kilo electron volts. Now you can see here that this actually doesn't appear that frequently. What actually happens is that you have a whole kind of spectrum. So you see that we have this white body here that I'm indicating here in purple and this is called Bremsstrahlung. So this is the radiation that is generated when the electrons get decelerated. So what's happening is that the electron essentially penetrates the material of the anode and then it gets slowed down and during the slowing down an x-ray is generated. What can also happen is that it's not just slowing down. Yeah? So this is another case. So here it's slowing down more because it's bending more. So here we lose more energy and in this case we generate something that has a higher energy. In this case we generate something that has a lower energy. Now there's this strange peaks here. You can see those guys here. There is this distinct peaks happening here and this is the characteristic radiation and the characteristic radiation is dependent on the anode material. So what happens in this case is that the electron hits an electron that is in the shell of the atom that is the material of the anode. And if we hit that then we actually get a kind of ionization so we kick out this electron and then the ionization causes another electron to fall onto the shell here and the distances between the shells they have a distinct energy and you can see now if this kind of effect happens yeah i mean this electron can still continue so it can continue to cause more bremsstrahlung but you will see that it kicks out one of these electrons and therefore it creates a distinct kind of peak, a distinct kind of energy, exactly the energy when from the higher shell the electron falls to the lower shell and this also generates some x-rays. These kind of x-rays that are generated here and this is exactly this kind of radiation and actually when you count the number of peaks here you can figure out 
how many shells you actually have. So we will look at that in one of the next slides actually. So what happens with the Bremsstrahlung? Well, in the Bremsstrahlung, this is something that happens quite frequently. The electron changes the direction and then it loses energy. And this is a probable event. So having the electron just enter the anode material and changing the direction is very probable. But what happens in a less probable case is that the conversion of the kinetic energy then also causes a photon to be generated. So in, the, in this probable event here, we are actually generating heat. So this just warms up the material. But in this case here, we are generating Bremsstrahlung. So there the electron enters the field of the atom in a way that it generates some additional X-rays. And this is what generates the Bremsstrahlung. So Bremsstrahlung is the basis, the driver for the X-ray generation and most of the photons that are generated emerge from Bremsstrahlung. Then there is also this other effect. This is the characteristic X-rays and this is exactly when you hit here one electron, the electron continues, but this one is ionized away and just goes to somewhere else. And this then causes exactly one of those electrons to fall down here. And because then we are missing one electron here, we also have another electron from the outer shell falling in here. So this is why you see these associated peaks. And the energy of those photons here, they have a specific value and this is exactly the distance that is essentially generated by falling down into the particular shell and this is characteristic for the material. So here you see the energy levels for tungsten. I'm choosing tungsten here because this is a very popular material for anodes. So diagram for tungsten and here you can see that we have an N shell, an M shell, L shell and K shell and the different electron configurations and then what happens is if we kick out one of the electrons on this shell it could happen that you know we have something falling down from the M shell or from the N shell directly or it could be falling down from the L shell. If something falls down from the L shell then you have an additional kind of falling down here and you see that there's also two possibilities and if the one from the M shell to the L shell is happening, you still need one N shell electron falling down to the M shell. Well, you might have heard about this already in physics and this is a very typical effect that happens when you ionize materials. Now this brings us to understanding the X-ray spectrum. So we have these two kinds of effects that generate the X-rays, the characteristic ones and the Bremsstrahlung one. And then this allows us also to understand the spectra of different energies. You can see that here. You can immediately see that blue here is this information and it has 80 kV. And this means that the highest photon energy that can appear is actually 80 keV. And of course, we can now also find that our purple spectrum here is associated with this guy here because the energy can only be converted into a single photon. And this photon is generated when we convert all of the energy of the electron into one photon in one go. So what you see here as well is that if you have spectra with lower acceleration voltage, like the blue one here, you can see that we have this peak in the Bremsstrahlung. So we generate more of the softer X-rays. And if we have high acceleration voltages, you can see that we have more of the higher energetic X-rays. There's a certain overlap. And actually there is a filter in here. So there is two millimeter of aluminum in the beam path, which then causes for the very soft photons to disappear. And this is actually something that we want to do because the soft x-rays, they will be absorbed very quickly in the tissue. 
and you want to filter them out because if all of them get absorbed anyway, you won't be able to see them in the image contrast. So you want to take away the low energies such that you have already photons that are likely to go through the entire body. Actually, this isn't ideal anyway. So what we would like to see in the ideal case is, of course, a spectrum that only has a single energy. And this is actually what is a basis assumption in computer tomography. But you see already here that this is not very realistic. So we would like to have spectra like this one where we only have a single energy. We could do that by filtering, but then we lose a lot of photons. And this means we need a lot of energy. Speaking of energy, we can also talk a bit about efficiency. And the efficiency can be measured by EDA. And EDA is essentially the total X-ray power and you divide it by the anode current and the anode voltage. So this tells us how much of the energy is actually produced in X-rays and how much power I actually put into the source in order to generate them. And you see that this EDA is actually not that great. So here is an estimation formula and you can calculate EDA or estimate EDA with the constant K here and K is approximately 10 to the minus nine, one over volts. And if you now know the acceleration voltage and the atomic number of the anode material, then you can estimate how efficient actually your source is. And you see here in this example that if I have an acceleration voltage and tungsten, I get approximately an EDA of 0.7%. 0.7%. This means that 99.7% three percent of all the energy is converted into heat only 0.7 percent of the energy is actually producing x-rays so this is what i meant with the probable event that it the electron just generates heat and here you see that less than a percent is actually used to generate the actual x-rays and then you also understand why there is so much heat generated and why we have to have this sophisticated coolant techniques. So in the total power, of course, you can then determine by multiplying either with the current and the voltage. And this will tell you how much you're actually generating. And with this simple formula, you can already get estimates how effective your X-ray generation will be. Now you see heat is really a huge problem and there is a new kind of X-ray source that is being developed right now. There's early prototypes already available. So we actually have one of these special new kind of tubes already here installed in Erlangen in our experimental physics group with Gisela Anton. And what they use is a very cool principle. They use liquid metal. So you remember that we had the rotating anode and we did that in order to get the energy away. What the liquid metal tubes do is they essentially have an anode that is not rotating or stationary, but it's flowing. So they have a nozzle. So here you can see a schematic of a nozzle. So it's very thin. And then they have a stream of liquid metal and you, of course, have to have a laminar flow here. And this then is taken up in a basin. You probably want to rotate this, yeah. So probably you want to rotate this in this direction here because then the flow is going downward and not to the right-hand side. And then what you do is you use this entire stream of liquid metal as the anode. 
And obviously now I can produce a lot more photons because I got rid of, I can generate essentially an infinitely long kind of anode dish because I can essentially have a reservoir of the liquid metal that then goes here and I pump it up again here. And depending on the size of this reservoir, I essentially determine the length of the rotating anode. All of this has to happen in vacuum, remember that. And now the electrons would essentially hit the stream of liquid metal and this would then generate our new x-rays that would then somewhere leave through a window and you can generate orders of magnitude more photons with this kind of x-ray technology. Now this is being done in experimental systems right now. You can use that in a stationary setting. So you set up the x-ray tube and then if you want to scan something, you place it in front of it. And if you want to generate different view angles, you actually have to move the object. What you'll see later is that we also use CT gantries and there we rotate very quickly about the patient. And obviously this kind of technology is very difficult because the inertial forces during the rotation would of course change the direction of our flow here. So things would be really complicated to actually install this on a rotating gantry. So current systems here use stationary liquid metal jet X-ray sources. But still that's a super cool technology, isn't it? That you can use liquid metal and then essentially stream it through vacuum and use it as an anode dish in order to generate high amounts of X-ray photons. It's really cool. And we are actually using this for generating really highly resolved X-ray images. And this kind of technology may be a game changer for X-ray microscopy. So it's a really cool technology and we think that we have a lot of benefits with this kind of technology. Well, we'll see that. This is research, but you already see now that the kind of things that we are doing here in this class, they're not just a basic introduction, but we also want to show you that everywhere in these modalities, it's not that far actually to go into a research direction. And now this is a research direction into the actual generation of the X-rays. So it's not like we discovered this more than a hundred years ago, and still there is new breakthroughs that are being discovered more than a hundred years after the discovery of X-rays. And you will also see that when we look then into the developments of CT, that there is a continuous trend to improve image quality, to use less photons and so on in order to get the best image quality possible for the diagnosis. Okay, so this brings us already to the end of this video. Now in this video you understood what actually X-rays are, how they have been discovered by Röntgen and how we can generate them. And the magic of the X-rays is actually that we are able to penetrate dense tissues and we can see through things. We can illuminate a hand and see the bones inside. So this is the magic of the X-rays. So, so far we only understood how to generate the X-rays and now we want to understand in the next video what's actually happening when the X-rays then finally hit the body and what kind of interactions they actually do there and how then finally the image is formed. So stay tuned. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'm very much looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye bye.